uh, thank you everyone for being here. So our next talk uh, by Ruby Mason and Olivia Sharp about uh, epidemic uh, spread simulator. So over to you, um, Ruby and Olivia. All righty, we'll go ahead and get started. Alrighty, so yes, I'm Ruby Mason and my partner is Olivia Sharp, and we created the Project Disease Spread Simulator. So we are seniors at the Gatton Academy in Math and Science here at WKU, and as a little bit of background, we created this project for the class Computational Problem Solving, which is CS or Math 371, which we took in the spring of 2020. We were mentored by Dr. Klaus Ernst and Dr. Uta Ziegler, and then we attach some of the course descriptions that can be found on the WKU website. So those are um, kind of quoted here. And you can see that it's using mathematical methods, algorithm techniques, um, and then the interest is being able to apply these with computational methods, um, and then in the context of research and problem solving. So the project we came up with is a disease spread simulator intended to be used as a learning tool for students receiving an introduction to epidemiology. So we imagine this used um, in you know, secondary education or um, in like high school, kind of an introduction to epidemiology. Users choose the characteristics of the region and the disease, and then watch an animation of the spread of their disease across the region and the graphs depicting the state of their population. Our model makes it easy for students to choose to see the effects of the choices they make, um, and then they'll be able to change those choices to see what happens. The key points that we're going to talk about in our presentation today are the mathematical model we developed, the population graphs that we show our users, the visual display, and then the user interaction with our model. Okay, so a little bit about um, the mathematical model that we use. So we use the basic SIR um, model, which allows for the tracking of three groups within a population. So that includes the susceptible population, the infected group and the recovered group, and those add up to N, which represents the total population. Okay, so some of the additional variables that are included in the SIR equations are featured here. So P is basically the probability that an infected contact will result in a new infection. So it's basically the infectious rate. And then the average number of contacts each day per individual is represented by C. And then the product of these variables is represented by beta, which is basically the number of new infections that occur daily per infected individual. And then we have gamma, which is um, our recovery rate of the disease. And of course, fatality, which is the fraction of infected individuals who die from the disease or its complications. So here you can see some examples of these equations. As you can see, they're all derivatives. And we include um, beta and gamma, and of course, n, which represents our total population. OK, so here's an example of implementing that math into Mathematica. So as you can see, we have a function at the top with our um, various variables. So we have our susceptible, our infected, our recovered, and then beta and gamma. So what this does, what this function returns is various interpolating functions, as you can see near the bottom. And these are basically the graphs of each variable um, and how they change over time. And these are the graphs that we use um, to show our users so they can kind of get a visual of how their disease is spreading through a graph. Okay, so I'm going to get um, in a second into um, how those equations work a little better. Um, but first, I'm going to go through some of the assumptions that we make in our model. Um, so the first one being that no vaccine exists. Um, second one is that all individuals are susceptible. Individuals can only become infected once and the population isn't changing due to immigration or immigration. So we know that these aren't exactly realistic. Um, but there are limitations with all or most mathematical models. So these are some of the trade-offs that we had to choose um, 
for ours. And so these are the assumptions that we'll use in our equations moving forward. So for the susceptible population, since everyone is susceptible and there's no vaccine, everyone, you know, everyone's susceptible. So the only way to enter the susceptible population is to be born. So this is represented by the natural birth rate of the country. And then to leave the, sus the susceptible population, you would become infected or you would die by natural causes not related to the disease, um, which would be the regional death rate. Then in the infected population, you would enter that population by um, becoming infected, leave the population um, by natural death not related to the disease, um, which still correlates with that regional death rate. Um, and then you've got leaving due to recovery and then leaving due to fatality. And then the recovered population, you enter the recovered population uh, after recovering from the disease and then leave the recovered population um, with the death from the regional death rate. Okay, so here's an example of one of those graphs shown to our users so they can get a visual of the progression of the disease. So as you can see, we have our three variables plotted. So you can kind of see how the infected um, has a spike and then begins as begins decreasing as people start recovering. And then we have our susceptible line, which decreases as our infection spike. And of course, we have our total population increasing due to new births in the area, and that's our yellow line. So in many cases, our users will choose variables that don't result in too large of an infection, or at least um, that infection can't be seen over a scale for 35 days. Like it's not a very noticeable spike as you saw in the previous slide. So for that reason, we included some smaller graphs representing um, each individual variable. And these, as you can see, um, represent a noticeable change. So as you can see, the infected data and the total population increase while the susceptible data is decreasing. Okay, so we wanted to apply all of this um, mathematical data and of course the population graphs into um, a regional spread depiction. So of course you have um, one infection and then that person comes in contact with another person and then it just grows exponentially from there. Um, so you can see kind of in this visual from the first corona cases in Wuhan, China, uh, we had like over 500 infections in one area and then the infection spread out from there. So it was a very gradual process starting from a hotspot. So in order to um, simulate this as accurately as possible, we added this function called add points, which basically um, references our first infection, which is represented by a point. Um, and then we select the random point and we use our function in proximity. You can see towards the bottom. Um, and this basically checks the distance from our first infection to the random point to see if it would be um, an accurate new infection. And that kind of creates a more um, accurate looking regional spread. So here are some examples of what that looks like. Our red points depict our first infection. And as you can see, most of the infections start um, are clustered around that first infection and they spread out gradually from there. So the other option that our users are able to choose with our program um, is a national spread, which we show within a whole country. So um, here we wanted to highlight kind of on a broader scale. So we're looking at COVID cases in the United States. Um, and here you see that there is a correlation um, between these two graphs where, uh, where one is looking at population per square mile and one is looking at COVID-19 cases. Um, and you can probably tell um, this is an outdated graph where uh, this was kind of at the beginning um, where COVID was just starting to spread in the United States where we might have a very different picture now. Um, but you can see that in areas of California, somewhat down by Florida, and then on the East Coast, where areas um, that are red on both graphs indicate higher population density and also higher concentrations of COVID-19 cases. So, you know, there can be multiple reasons for this. Um, higher contact rates between people, people living in closer proximities come into contact with each other, um, and so they're spreading the disease. Bigger cities often have, you know, big airports or people are traveling for business purposes um, or tourism. So diseases get spread that way. So we wanted to be able to model that in Mathematica. So 
Another challenge, you know, that we ran into with this, if we looked at the population density of the United States, we get, um, at least at the time that um, we were working on our project, was 94 people per square mile, um, which is, you know, assuming uniform density, which we know isn't the case, but that would look like um, people evenly spread out across the United States. But then if we look at New York City, the population density um, was 26,403 people per square mile. And then maybe if we were to zoom in on the state of New York, we would see concentrated people in New York City um, and maybe Rochester and Buffalo. So you would actually see people concentrated in clusters. So, you know, we realized that there would be a much greater challenge in showing this in a visual way when we would need to correlate with the population density. So uh, the way that we found a solution to this was by using the geohistogram function in Mathematica. So we used the um, cities within the countries and we took the largest 400 cities. Um, and then we correlated the number of cities shown on our country to the progression of the disease. So at the height of disease, the most cities are shown. Um, and then when the disease was just starting, there were less cities. So that gives the appearance um, it starts in the largest city. Um, and then, you know, when, when you're at the peak of the disease, it's reached the smallest city and then it starts to recede. So this is an example here. This picture is from um, Spain. And you can see some of those larger cities are highlighted in red, which shows um, it's showing a denser population, which we know is also correlating with the denser area of the disease. So um, implementing this into our program, we realized that it might be an issue um, with how fast it could be. So we didn't want something that would take a long time to load. And it was quite actually, you know, a lot of computation, especially with the geohistogram. So we ended up choosing um, kind of a longer loading time up front where it compiles a list of the visuals at every time step, which the times are split into days for the little animation. Um, and you can see an example of one of the, those lists here. So the top is the geohistogram, you can see Spain um, starts out just with a few dots on it. And then towards the middle, you can see you're starting to have some red areas. Um, and then this, you know, region that, that the user created in the bottom has just a few cases, cases start to pop up nearby. And then you've slowly got the whole region um, starting to be infected. Okay, so a little bit about our user interface and how they can kind of navigate through the program. So the first screen that they see is our menu which provides several options. So they can either select a learn more option and make your own country or choose a country option. So the learn more option basically provides um, more information about epidemiology in general. And that includes a little bit about each variable that they're gonna end up um, manipulating when they design their disease. So within make your own country, the user gets to choose kind of what they want their country to look like, shape and color wise, as well as the, what they want their infection dots to look like. And then of course they get to choose infection rate, um, the duration of the infection, variables like that. And this is also applied in choose a country except they select a already existing country and the visual will look something like the geohistogram that um, we just saw in the previous slide. So from here they're taken to their display um, and they can press play and see how their specific disease will um, progress over time. So from here, you can also go back to the previous slide where you can manipulate um, various variables because you'll get a little piece of feedback on the bottom of the screen during the display. So this might say, for example, if you have a very large spike um, to go back and make your infection rate a little bit shorter, a little bit smaller so that you can see kind of a different display and how that's gonna affect um, the spread of your disease. And you'll be able to see that with more detail when um, we demonstrate the program. And then from the display, you can also go to a summary, which basically gives you more information about all the selections that the user made. So if they um, selected, you know, 14 days for their display, it'll give more information about that. Um, same with the infection rate, recovery rate, and um, things like that. So some of the user inputs, like I just mentioned, within the region, includes the population, shape, birth rate, death rate, and social behavior. So the social behavior our user can manipulate, you know, are they acting normally like as they would, um, you know, without corona or um, are they social distancing 
or you can also select increased social behavior. For example, if there's like um, festivities going on, holidays, things like that. Um, and then our birth rate and death rate all are from the information provided by Mathematica through geohistogram. So these are just the regional birth rates and death rates um, that are, you know, actually exist in our countries. And then our disease data, the variables that our user can manipulate include the name of the disease, um, as well as the trans transmission. So of course, a disease that is spread through um, contact with another person's blood is gonna be a lot less infectious than something that is airborne. And our user can manipulate something like this, as well as the length of the illness and the fatality of the illness. And then we also have some more fun manipulations, which include the color of the region and the color of the infection. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and um, show you guys our program. So, let's see. I'll go ahead and show our notebook. All right, Olivia, can you see that the new new um, window popped up? Okay, I wasn't sure that it would give us the new windows on uh, yes. on Zoom. So this is the main menu um, of our program. The user is able to type in um, the little name of their disease. We'll just like, leave it as disease. Um, and then this was our little uh, learn more about epidemiology tab. So this is kind of some of the information that we've gone through in our program. Welcome to disease spread simulator. You've got some information here at the top about our differential equation model, um, the three groups of the population, and then the variables that we use to um, give the relationship between those three groups and population dynamics, the social behavior, how those may affect the graphs. So you actually can see on our model um, in a no normal social behavior graph may look like that. You increase the social activity, you'll get a sharper, um, a sharper spike in the disease, total social isolation, the disease is, you know, it's not going to spread. So you're not going to see any infected individuals um, besides the one original case. Um, and then decreased social activity, the curve does um, flatten out. And then I just talk a little bit about the three transmission types that are options. Um, so, you know, it caters to different levels of interest if you want to learn more or even backgrounds um, to where you're starting out on. So when you're done um, with that feature, you can set up to design your own region. So here you have all those options we can talk about. We'll do a different um, shape of our region. And my favorite is the stadium. Um, then you can pick out the color, how many people live in your region at the time. Um, this is the demographic information, the birth rate and death rate, which we found that it's kind of hard to estimate. So we just chose, you know, you can pick a country that you want it to be similar to um, because, you know, we couldn't come up with numbers off our head, off the top of our head. So we didn't expect our users to be able to either. Um, and then we choose the length of our simulation, fatality rate, type of transmission, um, the number of days someone's sick, and then the social behavior of your population. And then when you're done, um, you'll select that you're done with your simulation. It does take a minute to load, um, but we put in a little loading screen. And then you're presented with your graphs. You're able to watch the simulation as it spreads across. Um, and then the cases start to decrease. So um, our feedback here, there's a very large and quick spike in the infected. You selected a high transmission rate. So let's go back. We'll make changes. Our settings are saved. We still have the same color. The population data is still the same. Um, and we can change it to a different transmission rate, or maybe we'll decrease the social activity. We'll go back and check again. So this is how we intended our program to be used. Um, you can see that those two changes made a big difference in how our disease spread. And this is the kind of learning um, that we want the students using our program to be able to see the changes that they're making and then the direct effects that that has on, on what they're doing. Okay, and then the summary gives us a little bit of information, um, contact rate you chose and what about it and your disease and um, things like that. And so I'll quickly show the country and how that works, you should show a country. Um, Russia is pretty big, so we'll choose maybe one that will load a bit quicker. We'll stick with Spain. Um, and let's pick some ones here. Um, 
So we did note that for our choose a country option, um, it obviously takes a little bit longer for our display to pop up because through our geohistogram function in Mathematica, they're collecting obviously the 400 largest cities in that country and that's a lot of data to process and then we're creating um, a list of every single day and how our infection is being transmitted through um, these 400 cities. So obviously that's gonna take a little bit um, more computation power and computation time for Mathematica to display our, um, our regional spread. Yeah, so even here, um, you can see like in 14 days, we don't expect it to spread through the whole population in Spain. Um, but you can see in our tiny graphs here, well, we did have, you know, um, a fatality rate of our disease. So we do start to see the population trend down. Um, and then we do see towards the end of our time step that it is spreading um, and we're getting, oh, it's starting to spread. So that's the country view um, of our program. Start over takes you back to the, the home screen. Um, and yeah, you can just keep playing around with that. Lots of different things to explore. There's tons of different options. Um, and, you know, we've had fun playing with it. So we'd hope that students would as well. So um, let's see, we'll go back to slide up here. Okay, we're happy to take any questions now. And if you have any additional questions, you can also contact us by email. Any question for the speakers? Uh, and pharmacodynamic models of tumor growth and anti-cancer effects in discrete time. This is the title of my uh, joint presentation with Dr. Nakwin today. My name is Farhan Batisi. We both are uh, faculty in uh, the Department of Mathematics. This is a joint work with uh, Dr. Gilbert Koch. Uh, he is uh, at the University Children's Hospital, Basel, Switzerland. He is originally a mathematician, but he is an uh, expert in uh, modeling. Uh, we work with uh, two students in this project, uh, graduate student Kamala Dadashova, she finished her master's degree uh, last uh, May uh, 2020. And senior student, Sarah Peterson, she was a senior last uh, May, last semester, last spring semester, and uh, in the Getting Academy of uh, uh, Mathematics and Science. I like to start with historical background of fractional calculus. I know some of you are hearing about this, uh, you know, term uh, first time. So I like to talk about a uh, few things that everybody needs to know about fractional calculus. Then I'm going to continue with basic definitions, and then I'm going to introduce you continuous PKPD model. This is going to come from 2009 paper uh, written by uh, Dr. Gilbert Koch and his collaborators. Then uh, I'm going to introduce you H discrete PKPD model and H discrete fractional PKPD model. And we are going to continue uh, doing some comparisons. Uh, we are going to talk about simulations and we are going to finalize our talk uh, with some conclusions today. Historical background of fractional calculus. So fractional, fractional calculus is a, a branch of uh, mathematical analysis that allows integrals and derivatives to have any positive real order. On the other hand, discrete fractional calculus is the discrete version of fractional calculus which uh, concerns any positive real order of sums and differences. So when I say sum, 
then you don't understand and Tegran in continuous time. When I say difference, then you understand derivative in continuous time. Um, usually, when we talk about fractional calculus, we talk about this historical, you know, uh, event uh, between uh, two mathematicians, well-known mathematicians, Lopitan and Leibniz. Uh, these two mathematicians were, I should say, scientists were uh, e uh, not emailing, but <laughs> writing letters to each other. And they were trying to, you know, uh, find the notation for higher order uh, differential operator or derivative operator. And they were talking about this notation here. But then, um, in Lopidol's note, he was wondering uh, of Leibniz notation of this and order uh, derivative. What if n is one over two? In Leibniz's reply dated uh, September 30, 30th, 1695, he wrote, he wrote to Lopidol as follows. This is an apparent paradox uh, from which one day useful consequences will be drawn. Those the mathematicians believe that 1695 was the year that the fractional calculus uh, was born. In the following years, many mathematicians contributed to the theory. Euler, Lagrange, Lacroix, Fourier, Lubel, Riemann. These are just some of the you know uh, names that uh, they have done a uh, very nice uh, work in this area. Later in Kudner, uh, 1957, he defined as fractional uh, difference operator. And then I also like to mention that fractional calculus has been developed in the three main directions. One is Riemann Louisville, one is Caputo, and the other one is Grunwald Blednikov. But if you look at uh, recent uh, um, contributions to this area, then you are going to notice many other versions, uh, directions for fractional calculus. You will notice that. And in my uh, research, I always use riemann uh direction, uh, riemann louisville type definitions. And there is, of course, a reason for that. But all of them, all these three directions are doing very good job in terms of you know, applications. Uh, in discrete uh, time domains, uh, uh, fractional difference calculus should, uh, you know, it starts with uh, the paper by Miller and Ross, uh, 1989. And then there is a paper by uh, Gray and Zhang, Zhang in 1988, in the same year, you know, 1989, 1988, they are talking about fractional difference operators. And then um, with Paul Ilo, in 2005, I started uh, working in this area. And then uh, we had this uh, first paper published two years later uh, because we solved the problem uh, in a year, and it took us to publish the paper another year. So, uh, in 2007, um, our uh, first paper published. Then um, there are many other papers after this time. Uh, we are seeing uh, many mathematicians uh, became interested in this topic. I like to continue and introduce you. Uh, fractional operators as well as integer order difference operator. So let me first talk about integer order difference operator. So I am looking at this uh, Newton's limit definition of derivative. So this is kind of backward limit definition. And when you want to do approximation, you take out this limit and you do the approximation and you do get this approximation, y prime of t is approximately y of t minus y of t minus h over h. So we, we all know this from calculus one course. 
Now, here is the definition of backward H difference operator. So backward H difference operator comes from taking out the limit from the uh, Newton's definition of derivative. And then here I am talking about higher order uh, nabla difference operator. And this uh, definition of higher order is similar to the case in continuous, the derivative in continuous time. And then uh, we do have H rising factorial power, H rising factorial function, another name. And instead of uh, using the polynomials of continuous time, so for example, think about x square plus one. This is a polynomial of degree two, right? But instead of using x square plus one, we are using x to the two rising plus one. So uh, here is the definition. And we do have a Euler gamma function here. And we want to have this uh, quotient well defined in this definition. Because you know that gamma function has some uh, polar uh, you know, has some, uh, uh, you know, um, asymptotes, I should say, uh, at uh, negative integers. All right. So here is one thing that I want to mention, power rule. So when I apply uh, T to the alpha rising uh, factorial power uh, for the null operator, when I apply null operator to that, then it uh, reads like this, power comes down, subtract one from the power. This is like a power rule in, uh, for the derivative in continuous time. So we have the same picture. Uh, here is the fractional nabla H uh, fractional sum operator. And uh, when I say sum operator, then you do understand integral operator. So I am talking about any order integral operator. So one half power, one half order integral, E order integral. I don't know when you think of any positive real number. Alpha is positive real number. And what else can I talk about this? Uh, there is an operator here with the sigma notation, uh, which means the sum notation. And this is the kernel of the operator. And the kernel is a good thing that it is good to know that kernel is not singular. So it is not singular. That's something good to know. And we have here H fractional difference operator. Again, this is Nabla version because we are using the Nabla operator here. So when you, uh, when you are talking about alpha order uh, difference operator, then let's say alpha is one half, then uh, you consider alpha here one half, the upper bound is one, so n is one here. Here you have one minus one over two, which gives you one over two again. So first you need to calculate the one over two order integral or sum of the function, and then you calculate the number operator. So this is the riemann lulu definition of fractional. Uh, derivative fractional difference operator in discrete time. And I'd like to continue with the PKPD model in continuous time. The, here is the model. Uh, we have four uh, unknowns here and four equations. So we have a system of differential equations. But the thing is, this system is nonlinear because of this uh, term here, this quotient here. It is nonlinear equation. And when you add all this x1, x2, x3, and x4, then you have uh, total uh, volume for the tumor growth. And this, uh, again, uh, system was given and studied in the paper by uh, Dr. Koch and his collaborators in 2009. So let me talk about what does PK mean? What does PD means? Uh, PK and PD deals with uh, the distribution and elimination of a drug. Uh, this is what we call the pharmacokinetics, uh, the therapeutic effects uh, of a drug on a specific target. It is known as the pharmacodynamics. So here is the compartmental diagram for uh, this problem. And here, X1 is proliferating cells. Then there is a 
uh, you know, drug given so that concentration gets into play and then X2, X3 are other compartments and then uh, X1 becomes X2 and X3. These are non-proliferating cells and damaged cells and then, um, then we see some cells die out and goes out from this diagram. During end cancer treatment, it is assumed that uh, the, the growth dynamics of the tumor will be perturbed by the anti-cancer drug effect described with the model parameter K2. Due to drug action, proliferating cells become non-proliferating depending on the drug concentration. And then I also need to mention that W of T is the sum of X1, X2, X3, and we are going to co uh, consider uh, three comport compartments in our model. The tumor growth inhibition model was constructed in such a way that two fundamental properties hold. So during uh, drug administration, the tumor growth will be inhibited. This is the first fundamental rule that we want to have. And the tumor volume will never become negative. Okay, for all time. All right, here is the Gombert's component gets into play. So here is the Gombert's uh, component. Let me go back to the model given by Dr. Koch and his collaborators. You see this quotient here, that we are replacing this quotient and we are introducing this system of equations and there is a Gombert's component here. Uh, Many scientists uh, in medical area, they use um, Gombert's equations uh, to model uh, tumor volume. And here we discretize the problem. So we are replacing all the first derivatives by NABLA H derivative here, NABLA H equals operator here. And as you see, our equation is now uh, system of equation is now linear system of equations because of this uh, substitutions that substitution that we are doing here. And next we do have fractional order uh, system and we are considering here uh, first order novel operator and replaced, re replacing by alpha order uh, operator. Here alpha is between is zero and one. Hi everyone, my name is Nguyen and I will continue the talk with data fitting and parameter estimation. So in this part, we assume that we have n scalar longitudinal observations uh, represented by the statistical models number one. So in these models, the state variables WJ represent the tumor size over time. Fj beta here is the deterministic function represent the relationship between the parameters in the model beta and the state variables wj. Beside this two term, we also incorporate the error terms epsilon j. Here, the error term epsilon j could represent noise, measurement errors, or some other factor that are not included in our models. We assume that the error term epsilon j, j from 1 to n, are IID random variable with mean zero and constant variance sigma naught square, where sigma naught square is unknown. We then use realized data, um, we then use realized data wj from the observations of three compartment models to seek a value beta hat that minimizes the sum of square residual. Since we have both realized data for perturbed and perturbed tumor growth, both sets are utilized simultaneously in fitting the growth curve, the curve with and without drugs, and obtaining estimated parameters. The unperturbed growth curves are very similar to the perturbed counterpart, except for concentration C of T equal to zero for OT. Under the regularity assumptions, as the sample size is sufficiently large, the sampling distributions of beta hat is approximately multivariate normal distributions with 
the mean equal to the true mean vectors beta and the variance covariant matrix is given by sigma naught squared times the inverse of the products of the two matrix chi chanpo beta times chi beta where chi beta is a n by p sensitivity matrix with the element to be the first derivative of the function fj with respect to beta k. Sin beta and sigma naught are unknown. We have approximate, we have to approximate them using the parameter estimate to obtain the estimate for the variant covariant matrix sigma naught. Uh, in this formula for sigma naught, sigma hat square is given by uh, the ratio between the sum of square residual divided by n minus p, where p is a number of parameters in our models. Um, then standard errors of the estimate beta hat k can then be found by taking the square root of the elements on the diagonals of the variant covariant matrix. Um, from the point estimate and the standard errors of the estimate, we can readily construct a 1 minus gamma 100% confident intervals for beta k using the student t confident interval. So here in this two table, I present the results for the parameter estimate obtained by applying the model to drop A180. In our study, we apply the models to other drugs as well as, as, well as the um, combinations of two drugs. So here for the discrete models, we have five different parameters, U0, A, B, K1, and K2. We obtain the point estimate and the 90% confident interval for these parameters. For the, the discrete fractional models, we have six parameters, U0, A, B, K1, K2, and alpha. Beside the point estimate, we also obtain a 90% confident intervals for this parameter. And so if you look at this 90% confident intervals, you might notice that all parameters are statistically significant. So here I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about the comparisons of the two models that we uh, present in this study, the discrete and the discrete fractional models compared to the continuous models that were considered in the literatures. So here we have the table represent the residual sum of square okay, by fitting the data to these five drugs. And so here if you look at the table more closely, you will see that okay, our four our five drugs, either the discrete or the discrete fractional models, that a better job in fitting the data compared to the continuous models. Um, for example, for drug A2120, okay, in this case, the discrete fractional models result in a smaller sum of the residual square and thus is a better fitting models compared to the discrete models and much better than the continuous models. Here in the third columns of the table, we will see the percentage of improvement of the residual sum square comparing the discrete fractional models and the continuous models. Out of these five drugs, only in drug C100 that the continued models result in a better fit compared to the discrete models and the discrete fractional models. Um, in this figure, we uh, draw the fitted curve, the row curve of the tumor, and the actual raw data that we observe from the mice. Right. And so you can see that here we have the unperturbed data, right, represented by this curve, right, and this uh, data point, and the perturbed data, which represent by the square symbol here. And you see that okay, the discrete models does a good job in uh, fitting this data. Right, you see that the curve follow the point very closely. We also represent the, uh, present the simulations uh, result where we increase the dose by 10 times or by 100 times. And so as you can see, as the dose increase by 10 times or 100 times, okay, the size of the tumor drops significantly, but never become negative. 
right? Very similar for the dose of one, right? once we apply the drug, the size of tumors drop, okay, and then start increasing again. The same situation can be observed in applying the discrete fractional models. In this case, again, okay, the fitted curve fit the data quite well, okay, the curve follow closely to the data points here in both unperturbed and perturbed growth. Also, when we, in, when we increase the dough by 10 times or 100 times, the size of the tumor drops significantly, but never become negative. So here's some of the conclusion that we uh, draw from our study. First of all, discrete models are elementary to work with. Second, discrete models are quite accurate in data fitting. And as you can see, compared to the continuous models, it does a better job in fitting the data. Discrete models do not require us to use any approximation techniques. Okay? Um, and also discrete models possess the fundamental properties of PK, PD models when we increase the dose, meaning when we increase the dose, Okay, when we apply the dog, okay, the size of the tumor uh, decrease significantly, but never be, become negative. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. And so if you have any question, uh, please uh, send us uh, uh, some email to uh, fehanatc at wku.edu or nokwin at wku.edu. Let's thank our speakers. Do we have a do you have any questions for them? Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Um, yeah, so this concludes our morning session and so we'll begin in about an hour and a half.